Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Bob Lambert, who is in Chicago. How are you doing, Bob? I'm well, thank you. And Bob has over 30 years experience in strategic uh, business development, marketing, sales for Fortune 500 companies, as well as founding, uh, successfully founding four startup companies himself. And today he works with the Samurai Business Group. Uh, so um, what we wanted to talk about today was Bob has done some interesting workshops recently on one of the challenges facing sales management today. And I think a lot of people, well, anybody over a certain age can relate to this. <laughs> and that is the challenges of hiring millennials into the sales force. So Bob, uh, number one, what made you uh, feel that a workshop was needed, and um, what is the what is the core set of challenges facing people when hiring millennials into sales? Well, uh, John, and just a little bit of a background on this too is we've been associated with DePaul University's Center for Sales Leadership here for eighteen years in Chicago. So uh, this has been kind of a core development thing for a period of time because we're dealing with the students there. Um, we have a part of the curriculum that both is the undergraduate and graduate level. So I've been in and around these young people for a long time and see them evolving. <clears throat> and part of the core issue right now is, A, how do you attract them? First of all, do you even come to your company and want to work for you? The other thing that through DePaul and the research that we've seen also is, what are they looking for? Where are these young people, particularly if they're raising their hand and going into a sales position, what's that all about? And I serve on the board of advisors there with about 50 to 60 different companies and mainly large corporations, Fortune 500s. And in the board meeting back in the spring, you should have seen their jaws drop when they found out in the study that these young people before they graduate, that they want to put less at risk uh, as far as their comp goes. So it just absolutely astonished some of these people that, you know, uh, when you look, look at uh, comp packages where you have uh, smaller bases and larger commission structures. They were just the reverse of that. Now we found that the millennials of the millennials that have been in the marketplace for a few years, um, that switched. <clears throat> they don't want a cap on their income. Right. So the young ones, they want more security. Okay, and less at risk. Um, the key issues, the key elements there also is one of the things is the fact: what are you going to provide them as far as development goes? This is a real key issue. I have to tell you, your social standing and those kind of things you talk about, we you know, a lot of a lot of conversation about that. Oh, you got to be a good company. I mean, that's table stakes to these young people. Okay, that's table stakes. What they're really looking for, much like the traditionals or actually the boomers, they want to work for a good company. They want a company that has a good reputation. They do want a company that's going to participate and give back to community. But first and foremost, they want to make money. And they want to be that you are going to invest in their development and you're going to give them a career track. Now, that's not much different from my, you know, my generation. That's the things that we wanted. However, when we talk about the career track, that has shrunk down quite noticeably as far as their expectation. Uh, that's another thing, too, is busting some myth, a lot of the myth around that they are uh, entitled or entitlement. It's not that really. What it really gets down to is what their expectations are. Mm. And that's the other thing that you have to understand. So it's not about the why, it's what are they looking for and what is going to attract them. And particularly in a sales environment, we're seeing a big switch, as you know, to more inside sales. These younger people are coming in at the entry level in inside sales. Obviously, there's development that's going on there and training that's going on there for them to be proficient. But when you look at them migrating over into uh, becoming maybe outside salespeople or doing that, that's even more critical. And one of the critical areas for that is skill training, right. the whole relational skills. Mm -hmm. So that's, so that's an, an interesting point um, that you raised. The first one that's kind of fascinating is the idea that um, they may not initially want to put a lot of their compensation at risk. So that risk aversion piece, talk to me a little bit more about that. Why is, I, I understand what you said, they change later on when they realize that that's actually not the best way to approach it if you want to make a lot of money in sales. But why do you think there is that initial risk aversion? 
Well, I can tell you, uh, uh, we did that a lot here in society. Companies did that. When you look at wholesale bloodletting of company of people in corporations, they saw it happen to their parents. They've seen it happen to their grandparents. Mm-hmm. And so they are basically saying to themselves, why should I be loyal to a company? Why should I do these kind of things when I've seen the behavior of these companies you know, before and what has happened societally? Okay. So that's where you have the side hacks, where you have people now uh, spending less and less time in a job. And, and quite frankly, also, unless you've got the people say, well, I'm not going to invest in them if they're only going to be with me for a year or two years. Well, I can absolutely guarantee you they won't be with you for two years if you don't invest in them and put that forth. And what we're seeing is a trend is they will stay longer. They will stay longer, especially if you do the kind of things, uh, the wants and the needs. You know, uh, a lot of people are thinking about, you know, all the you know, the foosball table and all the entertainment and the food and all the rest of that stuff. That's not as big an issue for them as what you what the, it's been propped up to be, uh, especially with the, the Z's coming in now. We're seeing a whole different generation now starting to, to, to form and they definitely have a whole different approach to what the millennials are um, they're more savvy they're also getting more relational they're they're uh, not as dependent on the technology you're seeing the kids actually going out and playing together now they're actually getting on the phone together um, I had a mother come up in one of the workshops and when I was talking about that's this texting thing and back and forth because I have a 22 year old son I broke him over I said you know uh, you know, pick up the phone when I call you. <laughs> and she told me uh, she had to take away all of his toys uh, and everything basically until he got on the phone and talked to somebody. It took him 20 minutes to get on the phone to actually have a phone conversation. Yeah, it's it's a it's a whole fascinating dynamic, and I agree with you. I have, to be honest, I've never believed that the foosball tables and all of that were really the key component. Uh, and and I do agree with you. I think it's a phenomena that we've seen from the last, uh, the most recent recession is that uh, I do think that people um, no longer want to uh, base their whole life around a company, like, you know, locate to where the company is physically, etc. Because as you've said, um, if the company needs to downsize, you know, you're left maybe living in a high cost area, maybe living where you don't want to live. And I think, uh, thankfully, remote working has has allowed for that. So I, so are, are what you're saying is um, that there needs to be more of a kind of two way street here that they're looking for. Um, I'll, I'll invest as much in you as you kind of invest in me. Absolutely. Without question, John. Uh, we're seeing that, in, and uh, also the other part of this is, too, particularly when we talk about the subject of sales. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the studies and the research and reports, but it's estimated right now between 70 and 80 percent of sales managers in this country, butts and seats, have never had sales management training. I absolutely that also that. includes, it, it's just astonishing, it also includes one of the front-end things, a skill that they're not being trained in, that's to hire, to uh, you know, recruit, to hire, and onboard. One of the areas that we see is just really lacking, and again, I'm making a generalization here. Mm-hmm. Some companies do a better job than others, is onboarding, uh, you know, and the whole process of onboarding and then continuing the training uh, past that. Uh, and those are some of the areas that we're really starting to address now with our sales management mastery program is getting into those core areas. Uh, again, coaching and development of the people. Uh, these are skills that you need to have as a sales manager. And those are going to be specifically, I can tell you, huge skills for the millennial generation. You've got to be able to connect with these kids. Yeah, and I can and I can see that because I, I mean, I hundred percent agree with you. I think, uh, unfortunately, traditionally, uh, sales management that uh, a, a lot of people are obviously promoted into that position for being good salespeople or top salespeople, and. And it being one of the, I, I, I'm a big believer that the sales manager is actually your biggest revenue multiplier in an organization if you get that position right. But we don't invest in it. We say, hey, congratulations, you're now the sales manager. Just, you know, get the people to do what you did and everything is going to be wonderful, right? But as you say, when you talk about recruiting millennials, you're talking about recruiting people who are completely different from you. Yes, absolutely. And you said a great statement there, because what we find, you take your best salesperson, and turn them into a sales manager, which has got an 80% failure rate, number one, and you don't even train them on top of that, because these are two different skill sets. 
And what the other thing we're trending to see are the leading edge of the millennials now are getting into leadership positions. And quite frankly, that is a disaster waiting to happen if you don't give them the training and the skill training uh, to, to go with that. Uh, I've worked with some phenomenal sales managers over the year in training, and I will have to tell you that most of them were not top salespeople. That's the vast majority of them because it is a, a, it is a, a whole different skill set. It's like taking Michael Jordan and trying to turn him into Phil Jackson. Right. Uh, Michael, arguably one of the best athletes on the planet. Phil Jackson, one of the best managers on the planet as coaches. Two different skill sets. Yeah, and I think we've and and I think sports are always a good analogy because we've seen that we've seen top sports people become phenomenal managers, but we've seen a lot more average or decent um, yeah. sports people become you know become top uh, managers. So it's another it's another interesting thing to look at, right? So uh, as you try to attract attract millennials in into the work for into the workplace, right, and really help them um how do you how do you approach it differently than you would have once upon a time in terms of training and guiding them because um you know they come in with you know i'm trying to say this tactfully but they come in with a lot of preconceived notions right yeah well it's one of the things that i'm really proud to say that DePaul has done they've really busted a lot of myths about sales they're graduating about 900 kids a year through that program, and they're all going into sales roles. But they go in fully prepared. They're equipped, and as you, you know, as you know, with uh, sales pipeline, or now it's going to be a very intimately involved in that, which I'm thrilled to hear about. Uh, and so they're really coming in. But there's a lot of myth about that, as you all know. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, uh, you know, used card salespeople, the whole idea. Matter of fact, you're hard pressed to even see anybody's got sales on their business card anymore. That's how much of a a visceral reaction people have to it. They're calling themselves everything but sales, you know. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. It's from the standpoint of what's going to have to be different here about this. And you really have to start understanding, you know, the what about what it is about them to do that. And particularly the bigger challenge is if they haven't had the privilege of going through any training or been prepped on that and they've got this negative image, now you got that stereotype that you have to overcome also, you know, and get them comfortable with the fact that, you know, if this isn't the big boogeyman, or are you going to be a pariah in society? You know, <laughs> yeah, because I always think that, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, this go this runs very deep. You're correct. I mean, if you if you're um, a kid and you're uh, going to go to college or you're in college and you go back to your parents and say, "Listen, I'm thinking of either joining the IRS or one of the big tobacco companies or becoming a salesperson," they probably choose the two former before the latter, right? <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well um, said. Yeah. Um, so I think there's obviously overcoming those those, um, those preconceived notions. But one of the things that I really like, uh, and as you said, you know, Pipeliner CRM is going to be used by DePaul, and we're we're working with the DePaul um, and Daniel Strunk and DePaul closely. One thing is that I really like, and I think this is where we're going to see these these younger salespeople coming in have an advantage is the idea that they're going to be trained on CRM and technology from the get-go. And and rather than it's almost like over you know the last 20, 30 years, we've had to try and retrofit, if you like, take salespeople and retrofit technology onto them. These people are going to come in understanding the benefits of technology from the get-go. Oh well, yeah, they're going to embrace it. Uh, absolutely they're embrace it because they're technology native. OK, so this is not a big hump or hurdle that you have to overcome. What I would say that is very incumbent because a lot of people get the idea of CRM as a pro sales process. It's not, you know, it's historical documentation. You can take and if you have a good skills training, uh, you know, integrate that into which I know you guys are doing. <clears throat> and the interfaces of those things now are getting a whole lot better. I've seen your interface is terrific. Uh, getting a lot better, that's going to really put a lot of meat in the bone because now they're going to understand and, and fully embrace and see the manifestation and results of be having combining the analytics, the information all combined together with good skills wrapped in a package now uh, and not be this disparate kind of thing, you know, that they're coming together and in a system in a way to do this that's going to bring results, you know, because I know, and you know, the statistical information, you know, so, <clears throat> Pretty lousy adoption of, of uh, CRM, uh, and uh, and again, 
a lot of that has been, and you know this, as to how it's been implemented. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, this generation and the follow-on generation are going to embrace it, you know. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's going to challenge, and, and it's been something that we've obviously put a lot of time into, it's going to challenge uh, anybody who's supplying uh, tools, technology tools to salespeople. It's going to challenge them to be really useful, easy to use, and and give something, you know, return something to the user. Because let's face it, these, these uh, you know, kids coming through, they've grown up with, they'll only use technology that's useful for them, right? They'll, and, if they, and if they like it, they'll adopt it 150%, right? So the, really the onus is on us. And I think traditional CRM companies built it from a different perspective. And that's why it's, a, it's an exciting time. Um, so what are, um, in, the, in the last few minutes we have, what are some of the other um, challenges and, and opportunities indeed when recruiting uh, a new generation of salespeople? Uh, one of the critical things, too, that we address is also the behavioral interview. And, and there's some nuances now to that that have to be implemented when you're doing that. Uh, and a lot of people are not skilled at that, and particularly with salespeople. Now, let's just take the example of maybe not a new recruit because they don't have all the nuance yet. But if you have somebody that's been in the marketplace for a while, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. And traditionally, what I've seen with sales managers, they're telegraphing the answers. They're really not digging down underneath the covers. The other thing, too, is there's some very sophisticated uh, assessment tools now that can really pull out, particularly if you're looking for a hunter type, the drive, which is absolutely critical. Do they have the drive and are they people that would actually go out there and hunt and you don't have to go, you know, take them along or, or constantly, you know, trying to get them or motivate them to do something. Uh, so what I would also say, and I'm a big proponent of this early on, uh, maybe not pervasively when you're getting a whole herd of them, but when you're down to the final candidates, really doing a better job of assessment mm -hmm. to make sure that they're going to fit, not only from a skill standpoint, but also culturally. That's another big component here. Yeah, because let's face it, I mean, a lot of sales, and we've all been guilty of it, a lot of sales recruitment um, in the past has been, you know, let me hire 10 salespeople, and I hope that, you know, five or four. <laughs> <work out. laughs> exactly. And a great point, John, because in the future, when you are looking at this and you really vet these candidates well, you're not going to go with nearly as much of the, of the turnover. You're not going to have nearly the high spend that you have with the turnover. And you can take that money in turn and, and actually put that in a comp package that's going to achieve what you really want, a better high-performing individual. Yeah. And I think one last point that I think we should raise, too, about the about what DePaul and other universities are doing in, in actually training salespeople is um, DePaul has um, statistics now that the people who go through their undergrad program in sales and then are recruited um, tend to last longer and get promoted faster. So finally, we're seeing education break through in the sales space. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited because when we started working with DePaul, there's less than 30 college universities in the country that even have a sales course. Today, there's over 150. Mm -hmm. And so finally, the train is leaving the station. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, listen, Bob, this has been a fascinating conversation. So before we go, I'd like you to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself and about Samurai Business Group and how they can find out more about you and what you guys do. Yeah, you can go out to samuraibizgrp.com. Uh, guy, I'm proud that we got a new website out there. We're launching a couple of new initiatives. But the long and short of it, John, what distinguishes our program from others is the fact that in the sales arena, we coach and teach people how people buy. I feel like I'm Willie Nelson all of a sudden 25 overnight, you know, hit here because we've been talking for about this for over 20 years. And so our buying decision model is what um, DePaul really liked a lot. The kids took to it. We developed a case with them about six years ago now that's in 36 colleges and universities is at the core of that. Um, and there's a lot I can unpack with that, but go visit the website. If they want more information, they can they reach out to me. Uh, I take phone calls. I get my emails out there. I don't try to hide from anybody. It's even on my LinkedIn. Uh, the, the other part of this thing, which really we're really seeing a big uptick in is sales management. And that's another offering that we have. In four critical areas, as we said, how to hire, okay, and onboard people, uh, then setting up KPIs that match what the values are of the not only the individual but the company and driving that. Also, then obviously gets into CRM. Uh, also, uh, 
developing people in uh, you know, how to coach and develop. And then finally, we're taking and working on the individual, their individual uh, capabilities and their skill set to become that next VP of, man, of, of sales or whatever they want to send to. Yeah, I, I love it, Bob, and I would. And I would absolutely recommend that if you're going to make any investments in, in training, that investing in training your sales manager is one of the greatest investments you can make. And I guarantee you the ROI on that will be tremendous. Good. I, I, I echo it because you're absolutely right. It's the best investment you can make. And it's unfortunately, it's, a, it's an underutilized and undertrained area. So uh, I encourage any of your listeners out there, if they're really serious about this, they got to get management training for their people, you know, to do this. So. All right. Listen, Bob Lambert in Chicago, thanks very much for this uh, interview. Again, uh, I encourage you to check out Bob Samurai Business Group. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, and I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.